So a little bit about thyrodysinesis. As I said, thyrodysinesis is the most common permanent cause of congenital hypothyroidism. It accounts for 85% of the cases, and that includes athyreosis, that means complete agenesis of the thyroid gland. Agenesis meaning complete absence of the thyroid gland. Hypoplasia, where the thyroid gland is very small, not developed. Hemiagenesis, where only one half of the thyroid gland is there, the other half is not developed. Or ectopic thyroid gland, where the thyroid gland is not in the normal position, it's in a different position from where it should actually be. And the most common cause we see in dysgenesis is the ectopic thyroid gland. Okay, so athyrosis, as I mentioned, it plays a complete absence of thyroid gland, and this can be made out either in the ultrasound scan or radioactive uh, radio iodine or technetium 99, the thyroid nuclear scan. Hypoplasia, as I mentioned, small size nuclear gland where you will be able to see very mild to moderate razor uptake and less than third percent of reference values on ultrasound. And uh, the genes usually associated with this thyroid dysgenesis, as I mentioned, thyroid transcription factor 1, 2, PAX8, and if it is non-syndromic, it can also be TSH receptor resistance. So coming to dyshomogenesis, dyshomogenesis accounts for 10 to 15 percent of patients with congenital hypothyroidism and this is mainly, so in this case what happens is the thyroid gland is in the normal position, the thyroid gland looks uh, okay anatomically, there is no issue anatomically with the thyroid gland, but there is an issue in the biosynthesis of the thyroid hormone. So this usually happens when there are mutations in the genes that encodes enzymes, the membrane transporters or the structural protein involved in the thyroid hormone biosynthesis. Of this, the most common is TPO or thyroid peroxidase enzyme deficiency. And another thing which all of you would have heard of, there's something called Penrith syndrome. It's very important. It is a classic triad. So if you have a child who's developed, who comes in the neonatal period or, you know, childhood with known case of hypothyroidism and the child also has a huge goiter, neonatal goiter or fetal goiter and the child has sensory neural hearing loss, deafness. So that is a typical triad of Penrith syndrome. And this is usually because of defect in the iodide efflux. And this is because of the mutation in the SLC26A4 gene, okay, or the Pendrin gene. So in uh, we also have something called as thyroglobulin deficiency. As I mentioned, thyroglobulin is the transporter for thyroid hormones. So what happens in that case, the serum thyroglobulin level will be low, there will be goiter, thyroid gland will be enlarged, but screening... <clears throat> For the mutation is usually important, especially when a child comes with, newborn comes with elevated TSH, enlarged gland and very absent or low thyroglobulin levels. Okay, then we also have a something called sodium, as I mentioned, there is a sodium iodide transporter, right? So if there is a defect in the iodide transport, so the iodine is not able to enter the thyroid cells, that is because of the sodium iodide symporter defect or SLC5A5, it is also a rare cause of dyshomogenesis. Uh, so in this, what happens in iodide transporter defect uh, in a thyroid nuclear scan or isotope scan, there will be absence of uptake in the thyroid gland because of the defect. And this sometimes people can misdiagnose it to be a thyroid dysplasia or an aplasia because the isotope scan will be absent. So then you have to look at the salivary gland and you have to see if there is uptake in other areas. If there is no uptake in all the three areas that is suggestive of a sodium iodide symporter defect. So this is, again, in brief, as I mentioned, so this is the dyshomogenesis. So these are all the genes involved. Sodium iodine symporter defect, as I mentioned, the TSH receptor non-syndromic cause. Then we have the ATPase, which is important for production of ATP. The duox mutations are usually, can be sometimes transient and reversible. TPO, thyroid peroxidase defect, which is the most common cause. The pendrin, which is results in pendrin uh, syndrome. And we have the thyroglobulin defect. So coming to a central hypothyroidism, as I mentioned, there's primary and then there is central. So central is because of insufficient stimulation of the thyroid gland by the hypothalamus or the pituitary. So the hypothalamus is TRH and pituitary is TSH. So this usually happens if there is a hypothalamic or pituitary dysfunction. So this can happen as a part of congenital hypopituitarism where there are multiple enzymes involved. So sorry, multiple hypopituitary uh, hormones involved or it can also be isolated where only the TSH is involved or it can also be a part of the multiple syndromes. 
So familial hypopituitarism, this involves multiple pituitary hormone uh, deficiencies, and this usually results in mutations in the genes which are res responsible for the pituitary development. So as a result, the pituitary does not develop properly, and this results in multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, also known as MPHD. So the hormones here, the most common are HSX1, LHX3, LHX4, PITCH1, PROP1, etc. So coming to transient hypothyroidism, as I mentioned, a transient as of now, they can also be picked up by the newborn screening and they're being picked up with increased incidence now. So what are the some common things you need to know? So how when you're counseling parents, you need to know if it is a permanent cause or does it look like a uh, transient cause? So if it is a transient cause, it usually resolves on its own. If it's a permanent cause, it might require lifelong treatment. So it's very important to know what are the transient causes. So the transient causes, one, as I mentioned, it could be iodine deficiency or even iodine excess. So antiseptics containing iodine or drugs like amiodarone or use of radio contrast agents, maternal trap antibodies or TSH receptor blocking antibodies. So this usually, as I mentioned, lasts for three to six months. Um, the child might require treatment for some time or might not require a asymptomatic. That depends on whether the baby is also antibody positive and those kind of things. And in this, as I mentioned, the scintigraphic features may show that there is no gland. That is because the antibodies have blocked it. But if you do a normal ultrasound, the gland will be visualized. So that is the difference. Uh, it can be because of maternal ingestion of goitrogens. As I mentioned, dyshomogenesis, these two enzyme defects, duox2 and duox8 2 can be reversible or transient. There's also a, a, a disorder called as isolated hyperthyrotropinemia, where there is only an elevated TSH, but the T4 and uh, total T4 and free T4 levels are normal. This happens usually in preterm babies, sick neonates. This happens because of the transient immaturity of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Then, as I mentioned, maternal hypothyroidism, or if the mother is on antithyroid medication, then we have steroids. Uh, if the uh, mother is on steroids or dopamine, or even if the baby is on steroids or dopamine, especially if it's a very sick baby in the NICU, that can cause something called a sick hypothyroid syndrome or can also cause central hypothyroidism because of inhibition of the TSS release. And very low birth weight babies, premature babies should always be uh, rechecked. Uh, after one week or 10 days or before discharge has to the, the newborn screening or the thyroid test has to be done is very important. Any liver hemangiomas, they call something called as consumptive thyroid. So what are the symptoms of congenital hypothyroidism? So you can see the baby. The baby is having dry skin, coarse faeces, uh, uh, you know, enlarged tongue, protruding tongue. Uh, the baby will be having a protruded abdomen, can have an umbilical hernia, will be constipated, will not be feeding well, poor feeding lethargy, might have come prolonged neonatal jaundice requiring admissions for phototherapy with no other ABO or RH incompatibility. The child may have delayed milestones, not attaining neck control, not rolling over, delayed dentition if the child comes later on. And if the child is diagnosed very late, the child can also present with extremely short stature, delayed IQ, delayed development, etc. But most of the neonates might not have any symptoms. So that's why we also need, very importantly, need the newborn screening before it is too late and the brain development is affected. So uh, we have something called as a QBEX score. So this is the QBEX score for congenital hypothyroidism uh, based on the uh, score, uh, based on the uh, symptoms. So we give uh, a scoring one, two, three uh, uh, kind of a scoring and the total score is 13. And a score of more than four out of 13, you strong, strongly suspect hypothyroidism and you investigate accordingly. So as I mentioned, it depends on the age group. Based on the age group, there are different clinical features which are seen. Zero to seven days, there'll be prolonged jaundice, there can be uh, a high birth weight, poor feeding, hypothermia that is cold, not able to you know, maintain the normal temperature of the body, a huge posture of fontanelle. One to four weeks can present with failure to gain weight, constipation, lethargy, uh, not feeding well. One to three months can present with umbilical hernia, macroglossia, protruding tongue, mixedema, coarse cry, coarse facies. 
So how do you evaluate a child or a newborn baby who's come with primary hypo, congenital hypothyroidism? We need to ask a detailed physical his, uh, history and physical examination. Ask history about consanguinity because there are many genes which can be inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. Ask about the perinatal history. Is the mother on any and auto? Is the mother have any Graves disease history or autoimmune thyroid disease? Is the mother on any antithyroid medication or any other medication? Was there any iodine exposure? What is the uh, did she follow the recommended dietary allowance for iodine? Uh, and then once the baby is born, you look, or when the baby comes to you in the OPD basis, you look at the physical examination. You look for any signs of dysmorphism or any other associated anomaly. So as I mentioned, all these genetic defects can have other associated anomalies in the form of cleft palate, congenital heart disease, hypotonia, etc. And you also ask if newborn screening has been uh, done uh, in the baby, uh, you know, once the baby was born in whichever hospital the baby was born, was the newborn screening done and was the report collected? Okay. And then how do you proceed? You have to proceed with first doing the thyroid evaluation. Then you do with the imaging to identify what is the etiology. And you do a hearing screen because as I said, Pendle syndrome, sensory neural hearing loss, and in general, hypothyroid thyroids also can have some amount of hearing loss. And uh, if a baby in the fetus itself is having a long-standing severe hypothyroidism, then what, what happens? We can do an AP radiograph of the knee and that will show an absent lower femoral epiphyte and this suggests very severe congenital hypothyroidism and this usually correlates with IQ and intelligence and motor scores at the later life. <clears throat> so uh, what criteria do you need? So, uh, so as you all know, newborn screening is uh, a universal thing which is done all over worldwide. It tests some basic diseases, newborn diseases, which can be easily detected and prevented uh, out of it some uh, Countries might detect around 10 to 14 diseases. Here we do usually seven diseases. So we need to know why does hypothyroidism fit into the criteria for newborn screening. So because congenital hypothyroidism is a very important public health problem and this test is very simple, the test is reliable and if left undetected, hypothyroidism might not manifest at birth and routine examination might be normal. We know the natural history of the disease and the treatment is very important as I mentioned to prevent mental retardation, to prevent mortality, morbidity and delay in diagnosis can have major long-lasting impact and screening is very cost effective, it is not even expensive. So that's why it's very important to test for congenital hypothyroidism in newborns. <clears throat> so these are the two basic guidelines, very important guidelines, which we use, uh, uh, prepared by the team of ISPE, Indian Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology. Part one is the screening and confirmation of diagnosis. Part two is the imaging treatment and follow-up. So you can just go through both these guidelines. I will also be talking about it. So, as I mentioned, newborn screening for hypothyroidism can be done with either two samples, either the cord blood sample or the postnatal sample. So, each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. Either is okay, but you should know which are the advantages and disadvantages so that you can take a decision appropriately. So, a cord blood sample, you don't have to prick the baby so it's painless. You get how much of a quantity of blood you want. It's not affected by the TSH surge, as I mentioned in the first 24-48 hours. And even before the discharge of the baby, the report will be ready. So, what happens sometimes we discharge the baby and we tell them to follow with the newborn screening but they do not follow they forget about it and they don't realize uh, so that's the problem uh, if it is a postnatal sample the other advantage is it can screen other disorders as well because there are some disorders which require feeding to happen to, you know to be picked up like metabolic disorders that might not be picked up by the cord sample and uh, at the cord blood sample, any uh, the nurse should be trained, you know, 24-7 because the delivery can happen anytime. But this we will do it only in the morning. And any special situations, better to do newborn screening. And it can be done even at home delivered babies. Because once the baby is delivered, they come to the hospital after 48, 72 hours for checkup. We can do it then as well. Uh, cord blood sample, the disadvantages, as I mentioned, round the clock personal, metabolic disorders might be missed and some perinatal factors might also affect. But postnatal sample, if taken, especially before 48 hours, false positivity, it's a little painless to the baby because you have to pick it and it needs a more special RC system. 
So the timing of the sample is very important. Either, as I mentioned, either you take the cord blood or postnatal sample after 48 hours. So 48 to 72 hours, not later than five days, it should be collected for screening. That is a heel prick sample. And in case, in case it, the infant is getting discharged early or there is some need for blood transfusion, then you can collect it earlier, but the cutoff will be different. The cutoff of TSH will be higher. So that is also important to know. And um, the screening, the first screening is the same, be it an IUGR child, be it a term or be it an extreme preterm, but in preterm babies or sick neonates, we might have to repeat the screening. In term healthy neonates, we do not have to repeat. Uh, if it is a sick newborn, sample should be collected before seven days of life or discharged from the NICU, whichever is earlier. So this is the conclusion and it has to be taken very noted off in the back of your head that no infant should ever be sent home without a congenital hypothyroidism screening. So it's very important if it is not happening in your hospital, make sure that it is done because it is also cost effective. It is not very expensive as well. So there is no reason why it should not be done. Okay. So a little bit about how to collect the sample. So cord blood uh, sample is very uh, simple. You just collect it from the placental side of the cord and uh, you collect three to five ml of blood by cutting the cord between the clamp and the placenta and you just prick the placental vein with a serine needle and syringe. And you can store at four degrees and transport to lab within the day. So what is more important is in the right hand side, as I mentioned, the postnatal sample or the heel prick sample. So this is the heel of the child. You have to prick only on the sides and never in the center and the heel prick should be it will it should be drops of blood and it should be a full circle as I mentioned it should never be layered like this or never be spotted it should be air dried and transported at room temperature so here you can see this is the newborn screening card these are the circles and the circle has to be entirely filled up with a drop of blood